Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Ahia Shalel, the moderator for this session. Now we've reached the fourth webinar of the event and the first for today with the title of Rebranding Geophysics for the Future Energy Market, presented by Dr. Mohamed Amrouch. Mr. Amrouch is a passionate geoscientist with a blended experience between academia and industry. He completed a PhD in geophysics at the Tokyo Institute of, Ge of Technology in 2016, where he developed a novel implementation of the full waveform inversion for shallow soils velocity profiling to be applied for earthquake engineering purposes. He also worked as a research assistant with the same institution among the Global Center of Urban Earthquake Engineering Program, targeting reduction of globally increasing se seismic mega risks. He is currently working as a geoscientist with the oil services company Schlumberger in Japan, providing software-based solutions to challenges faced by the upstream oil and gas companies in Japan. Parallel to his primary duty, he is also heavily involved at different projects with universities and other research institutions institutions, sorry, trying to find the new to find the, to find the new domains of application of the existing exploration geophysical methods. With an international experience revolving between academia and industry, his fields of expertise and research interests involves hydrocarbon reservoir exploration and modeling, geophysical applications for geotechnical challenges and renewable energies, earthquake engineering and seismology, and recently a more particular interest in planetary geophysics and lunar exploration. Uh, before we start, I would like to remind you that the session is being recorded and will be shared on YouTube. And also, I would like you to fill the attendance form that we will share in the chat box. And doctor, the mic is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Aya. Uh, let me just share my screen so that we can start. So can you see my slides? Can you please confirm. Not yet. <clears throat> yes, now we can see it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aya, and thank you uh, all the uh, Petroleum Club and SPE student chapter in Boomer Desk for having me. It's a great honor and a great pleasure to, to share my expertise with you guys. And I would like to also congratulate you for uh, taking this initiative. You know, it's, it's very, very important to gather the community virtually and, and share experience and uh, what we are doing with, with the students and all over the world, especially with um, with the online webinar, it's, now it's, it's become public. So thank you for this initiative, right? So uh, today I'm going to present uh, what is going to be done in geophysics for the near future, rebranding geophysics for the future uh, energy market. Yesterday, Amin Rabat presented a very insightful lecture uh, demonstrating what is uh, being done for, in geophysics for, for the oil and gas and renewables. So today I'm trying to push a little bit forward uh, from his presentation and show you some case examples and studies on what's going on in the energy sector. So without further ado, uh, these are the outlines of my presentation. We will start to see, uh, this is actually a very general presentation, right? I don't going to go into too much details, uh, just to give you a general insight on what is going on recently in the energy sector, what kind of transformation is the industry is going on. And then I'm going to show you how we are going to rebrand geophysics for the future energy market, discussing some technical examples and some uh, case studies for geothermal exploration, CCUS, methane hydrate, and even planetary exploration geophysics. And finally, conclude this webinar with some opinions, personal opinions and conclusions and some remarks. Okay, so uh, let's start with what is going on with the energy sector recently. I don't know if you guys uh, are curious enough to, to have a look to the different websites of the major oil and gas companies, but if you didn't, let me share with you what is being done. So this is a snapshot of the different oil companies. This is Equiner. So if, when you go to the website, you will first see a big picture of an oil field with windmills, you know, um, we, and they're saying that we energize the lives of 170 million people. So they are emphasizing on windmill and renewable energies. Same for Total. You know, Total, they changed the names. They became now Total Energies. They used to be called Total, now became Total Energies. And they said that the energy is reinventing itself. Total is becoming Total Energy. So companies changing the names. Uh, ExxonMobil, you know, a big player in the oil and gas. ExxonMobil aims to achieve net zero emission. We will see what does it mean. Uh, a client in Japan, you know, this is not only in the US and Europe, in Japan, impacts a new wind 
of energy showing a geothermal station in Japan at the first page of the of the impacts webpage. Even Schlumberger is trying to rebrand, we are trying to rebrand ourselves and try to provide uh, the, and help customers on the energy trans, the transition in a private home market. Uh, you can see Chevron, you know, BP, they're all showing, you know, green energy, BP net to zero. So everybody is committed to the net to zero. What is the net to zero? Now, we can try to, I'll try to give you a general idea on what is going on here. So in recent years, the energy sector was responsible for around three quarters of the global greenhouses. We all know that the industry is, is not clean and we are emitting too much CO2 in the environment. So in a global effort to reduce the carbon footprint, a net zero by 2050 roadmap by the global energy sector was announced uh, by the International Energy Agency, uh, aiming to help the industry to reduce their carbon footprint down to zero by 2050. Now 2050 is just right to the corner. It's not very far from here. And we are taking tremendous efforts from all the different layers to, to reduce these footprints. The other reason why uh, the, energies, uh, the, the energy sector is transforming is that we all know that fossil energies are finite, right? We cannot rely on them for the next 300 or 400 years. So that's why we really need to take prompt accents right now so that we can be able to keep the energy consumption momentum for the next generations. And this is have to be done right now by uh, in, by, by you know, not only relying on uh, fossil energies and try to increase the energy mix for the future. Okay, uh, not only oil companies, but even the academic societies are transforming. You know, I'm a geophysicist, I'm, I'm, I'm very heavily involved with the SEG, uh, Society of Exploration Geophysicists. And if you can go to the, the LinkedIn uh, web page of the SEG, you will see that they're showing this, you know, they are going to change. They are in the wrong point now, and they are not. They don't have the ch chance to the choice to remain uh, as we are. SEG is going to change. So now they are discussing if they are going to create a brand new SEG where they are going to continue and strengthen the oil and gas geophysics exploration, but they will try to grow in non-oil and gas areas such as the near surface mining, planetary, and environmental. Or they are also discussing the option of merging with other associations such as SPE, AAPG, and EAG. So. They are discussing, they are taking, they, 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 they prepare the task force, strategic option task force, and as you can see some, some feedbacks from the strategic options as, as a task force for, uh, internally from SEG, they're saying, my suggestion that we can merge with EAG, or they're saying maybe they could merge, so they, they probably they would rebrand themselves, but still, it's a tremendous moment now that going on, and a lot of change are taking on, even for academic societies, not only for the oil and gas industry sector. Okay. So let's go back to the net to zero 2050 roadmap. What is the net to zero 2050? So it's uh, the International Energy Agency released a roadmap for realizing uh, net zero carbon CO2 emissions in the energy sector by 2050. So what we need to, to keep in mind that two, these two points are very important for us. Fossil fuel phase out is inevit inevitable, as I said. Uh, this is not something we need to, we can rely on the next uh, 100 of years. So there will be no investment in the new coal or oil and gas supply. And this is a red zone for us because we have to be very careful that there will be not so much money put, put in oil and gas um, exploration. And also the annual uh, renewable electricity installation must triple by 2030. So this is a very milestone uh, figure here. You can see uh, starting from 2020, the industry this is the electricity and heat industry, and we need to reduce our CO2 carbon footprint down to zero. And these are some flags in our longer roads where we can, uh, that some, some policies are starting to be implemented. Probably last year, the first policy was that, that there is no, no new oil and gas fields approved for development, for example, right? So transformation is already taking place right now, and we need to take quick actions and learn how we can readapt and rebrand ourselves. Uh, for, 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 for the market outside oil and gas, okay? All right, so climate change, is it a myth or a reality? I'm not here to answer the question, but just to let you know, this is an old story. This is not something we are started right now. We started back to the 80s. Uh, I don't know if you guys uh, do remember that, but during the 90s, I remember as a kid, uh, you know, I was bombarded, we were bombarded by the ozone layer. You know, ozone layer is going to kill us all. So this is not something new. Then we had the uh, the 20s, you know, we, we started talking about global warming. So we are not talking about the ozone layer anymore, but we're talking about global warming, a global issue. And probably you, you, you saw that there are each, each, each decade have its own 
policies and protocols. You have, you have the Montreal Protocol, uh, then you had the Kyoto Protocol, you had the Paris Agreement for the climate change, and finally, uh, now we have the net zero by 2050 initiated. But the, the difference is that nowadays, starting from the 2020s, we start to see the change. You know, uh, there is a worldwide forest all along the, all along the globe, deadly floods in Europe, unexpected drought even in Algeria. This is a picture taken in Taksa Dam in Tizi Wuzu. You know, I've been there like three weeks ago and I was shocked by, by the, the drop of the, of the water level and it was so dark and it was almost half empty. So uh, again, this is something it's that we can already see right now uh, in front of our eyes due to, to the climate change. Another important milestone happened in two years ago is the COVID-19. The COVID-19 uh, started a new era where we recorded the first drop of CO2 emission, global em emissions in the last 30 or 40 years. So you can see this graph here. This is the global fossil CO2 emissions, and this is uh, twin, this is the, the time scale here. So you can see that the COVID here uh, was the was really uh, well. This is mainly due to the lockdown and the and, and the, the, the travel restrictions. So we we reduced our CO2 emissions significantly for the last thirty years. So starting this new era, we learned how we use digital technologies. We started working remotely. We started studying and teaching remotely using digital technologies and online learning. So now this is going to be a, a new era. You know, many companies are standardizing teleworking and standardizing remote learning and travels will uh, travel business trips are, are going to be only uh, for extreme necessity, I would say, okay? So again, uh, we learned how to enhance our productivity due to the COVID and we learned how to re work remotely. And this is a very, very important factor on the next years on how we're going to reduce our energy consumption. Uh, so the post-COVID-19 era also uh, was an outstanding school, and we really saw the digital transformation in action. Here I'm going to talk about oil and gas digital transformation. You guys, I think you already heard that the industry started to take serious actions to use the cloud technologies and automated automation machine learning and uh, automation technologies to automate, uh, you know, our workflow as a geoscientist or drilling engineer, uh, etc. So, for example, as Schlumberger, we have the Delphi Cloud Platform. It is a platform that allowing you to uh, do a very, very advanced and shorten your, your, your workflow, technical workflow by taking advantage of the powerful cloud environment, you know, the powerful machine learning and, and, and artificial intelligence algorithms and help you to automate all the decisions. So what used to take you months now is going to take you weeks or days, okay? And we achieved outstanding results with our clients in the last two years due to the COVID, you know, people started working remotely. So instead of going to your workplace and your workstation and, 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 and do your job as a geophysicist, your interpretation job, or 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 your uh, uh, seismic uh, seismic processing jobs. You know, now you can do it from your home remotely. You simply need to access an account, just like you do with Netflix, and then you have your all projects on the cloud, and you have you can use unlimited resources on the cloud and work remotely and advance very quickly. So this is a game changer, and we saw how the digital transformations uh, showed outstanding results in 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 the, in the post COVID era. This is just an example to show you how the uh, how the, um, the digital digital technology is going to change our way to, to do things and, uh, and how we enrich our sim, our seismic to simulation workflow. So usually, as a geophysicist or geoscientist, we go for reservoir characterization. We go from seismic processing, seismic interpretation, then we build a 3D structural model, build a 3D physical petrophysical model, and then give the petrophysical model to reservoir engineering team who are going to run dynamic model to give us finally an insight and do some uncertainty and optimization for volumetrics. So this is the traditional way we used to do it manually, but thanks to the digital transformation, now, the, uh, I mean, smart, smart algorithms are going to automate this. For example, uh, we are going to earn four times turnaround of the subset of the earth model building for, for, for earth model building for the seismic processing. Uh, we are going to enhance seismic interpretation speed automating thanks to the machine learning extraction tool by 10 times with time reduction. Uh, we are going to automate, you know, well correlations thanks to the machine learning of the petrophysics by 200 times, you know, this is not going to be a manual process, this is going to be fully automated. And finally, the property modeling is going to take 50 times faster thanks to the cloud elasticity and the cloud powerful computation. And finally, the performance of probabilistic resource, you know, we're talking about imaginary numbers here, 500 times faster. So this is going to shrink our workflows from months to days. Right, so let's back, go back to 
uh, geophysics and how are we going to rebrand geophysics for the future energy market? So we know that we have uh, we have learned thanks to the, the COVID and thanks to the thanks to, to to the remote working and thanks to the digital technologies that we can automate many geophysical methods, right? So we can implement this automation and all these technologies to help us in the energy transition. And today, I'm going to discuss mainly four case studies of renewable energies and how geophysics is going to be applied or how geophysics is going to be rebranded for this, uh, for these four different uh, renewable energies. So let's start with the uh, geothermal energy exploration. Um, so the geothermal resources consists, um, consists of rising hot water and steam trapped in permeable and porous rocks heated naturally uh, by the geothermal gradient that originates from the subsurface. So usually you have rain surface and, uh, and, and surface water that are going to, uh, to, 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 link, to, to, to leak down to the reservoir. And the, due to the hot zone here, the hot water is going to be heated and going up to the surface. So we need to take this hot water as, as a source of energy and use it. So the reservoirs, we, we talk about reservoirs in geothermal, just like we do with oil and gas, by the way. Um, so the reservoir in geothermal can be discovered by testing the soil, applying some geophysical methods, analyzing the underground temperature, uh, so the heat energy can be brought to the surface by uh, following ways directing uh, from hot spring tertiary or geothermal heat pumps. And we can use this uh, energy as a direct use of, of geothermal as a source of energy or an indirect use by generating electricity. So this is the map showing the world map potential of uh, the relevance, the relevance of uh, geothermal energy all around the world. And you can see this red zones here in the map are the high temperature regions. I know you guys are all watching here, and I think the North Africa also is, is, is a hot, uh, hot temperature region, but mainly it's, it's around, around the Pacific belt of fire. You know, this is where tectonic, tectonic is very active. You know, we go from Japan, South Asia, and then you have North America and then South Americans. Now, this figure here are showing the resource estimation, you know, the gray zone here is the resource estimated. You know, this is very similar to what we call in an oil and gas proven resource of the geothermal energy, right? And the green, the, the green and blue colors here are showing the current installed capacity. So as you can see, we are just using 5% of geothermal potential energy all, all around the world, as you can see here, especially in Asia. You know, North America, Asia, we have the huge potential. We still have 95% of geothermal energy that waiting for you guys after graduation and use your know-how and geophysics to, to, to help on the exploration, okay? So huge potential is for the geothermal energy. Now, for the different geophysical methods we use uh, to, 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 to map the geothermal reservoir, we have thermal methods, you know, this is simply mapping the thermal distribution at the surface. And we have tried to delineate, uh, you know, heat maps at the surface to know where is the, the heat flow reg originally assessment. We can use also gravity and magnetic, uh, the gravity measurements are used to detect geological formation with different densities. So gravity and magnetic also are a very powerful tool uh, to map geo um, geothermal reservoirs. We also use electrical, electrical resistivity. This is for more for shallow, uh, shallow zones. Magnetotelluric also using the natural uh, source and magnetotelluric of the earth. And then finally, seismic data. However, seismic data, of course, the seismic data are, are the best, you know, because we're giving us quantitative and qualitative energy, but the seismic data remain very, very expensive and take a lot of time to, to acquire. Um, in oil and gas, we can afford to have seismic because, because we have a high return on investment. You know, the money you put in your seismic data, you can get it back by, by quickly by, by, oil, by oil prices, but in geothermal, it still uh, need a lot of money. So, uh, so we usually prefer to go for the uh, non-seismic methods for geothermal uh, modeling, right? So we also use the inversion. Uh, so inversion is a very broad word in geophysics, but here what I mean by inversion is inversion of gravity and magnetic and magnetotelluric data, right? So we, we usually acquire gravity uh, data by using different means. It can be by satellite, marine survey, field measurements, or airborne survey. And then we create 2D gravity and magnetic maps, and then we do the manual interpretations to understand what kind of geology is, is creating the anomaly in our, in, our, in our reservoir. However, we can do the 3D inversion uh, so that we can have a subsurface initial structure and we can start doing some 3D structural interpretation based on 3D uh, potential field inversion. And this is something uh, quite new and, and, and a hot topic in, in the exploration geophysics. All right, so why do we do inversion? So the main idea is to reconstruct the geothermal 
3D reservoir model. Okay, and for this we have what we call the what I call a conventional approach uh, using geology, geophysics, and geochemical studies. Okay, so for the geology uh, we are going to create a conceptual reservoir geological model thanks to the uh, to the folds and uh, thanks to the geological interpretation that looks like this. We talk about caprock as well. Uh, we talk about the source. This is the heat uh, zone where we are going to have our reservoir. So this is a very approximative um, interpretation. And then we try to enhance the interpretation using uh, geophysical data and integrating geophysical data such as magnetotellurics, such as gravity inversion, density inversion, and reduce the uncertainty of the geothermal reservoir. And then finally, um, geochemical uh, lab people you know are going to do some laboratory studies to understand the structure and the chemical uh, nature of our geothermal however there is a mother approach which is advanced approach of geothermal uh, of, geo of geothermal reservoir delineation where we are going in addition to the geology geophysics and geomechanical uh, geochemical we are going to include geostatistics and geomechanical studies okay so in geothermal reservoir it's very important to understand the fracture and the faults in the reservoir because uh, we are going to try to to link to drill along the along the fractures down to the deep so that we can extract the, the water from from the hot or the steam or the hot water from the reservoir so understanding the uh, the um the full distribution or the fracture distribution of the subsurface uh, is, is is very important and we need to do some geostatistical statistical analysis now why do we need why do we use geostatistical uh, studies just like we do for the oil and gas it's because there are three approaches or the three states in our study, okay? There are things that we know that we know. It is quantitative data. We're talking about drillings, porosity, fascias, uh, fracture along the well, you know, as far as you drill, you know what you see. So this is thing you know that you know. There are all the things that you know we don't know, for example, uh, exact, exact oil reserve, lateral geological variation or anisotropy. This is where geostatistics can help us to build a more accurate model by running some uncertainties and. Uh, quantifying the things we don't know at the subsurface. And finally, there are things we don't know we don't know. After all, we are human and only God knows. So are we going to use geostatistics in this uh, second point, where we are going trying to minimize the risk, minimize the, uh, the uncertainty of our fracture distribution at the subsurface. And this is where geostatistics can play a significant role from what we do traditionally on geothermal re reservoir modeling using just geology, geophysics, and, ge and geochemical. And finally, geomechanics can play a significant role in, in properly delineating, you know, the subsurface uh, fracture distribution. And this is by doing, you know, it can be 1D, 2D, or 3D, uh, 1D or 3D geomechanical analysis by including, you know, the, the all the tectonic of the area and understanding of the stress distribution of your reservoir uh, to have a more complex and more complete geomechanics uh, study. You can also predict the, the distribution of the faults at the subsurface, but this is a very mature stage of, of, of geothermal, uh, ge geothermal, uh, geothermal modeling studies. So again, we have the basic geology, geophysics, geochemical uh, going to help us to draft an initial model, but if you want to push forward, we need to include geostatistics and geomechanics in our reservoir model, okay? Uh, this is a case study uh, I, I'm, I'm co-authoring with, uh, with the professor uh, from, from the United Arab Emirates, Professor Saeed B. Hakim. Uh, we are trying to, where we try to delineate uh, the, the, the geothermal uh, potential hot springs in the United Arab Emirates in Abu Dhabi, in the city of Al Ain. Uh, we did some, we measured some measurements at the, at, at the city. This is the city of Al Ain. We had uh, some um, uh, magnetic data as well as gravity data. And uh, we try to reconstruct by 3D inversion of the magnetic susceptibility data at the subsurface. And as you can see, uh, we try to correlate with the geology at the subsurface of the line. And we have a quite interesting correlation between the initially interpreted geology and the formation of the, uh, the magnetic susceptibility, susceptibility inversion. Uh, this is a result we published in 2019 in a conference. This is actually, we have other gravity data uh, working on a paper that hopefully going to be published soon. So I will not spoil you guys. And once we publish, you can see our result, including gravity data. Okay, so if you want to learn more about the geothermal potential in Algeria, um, I'm also I'm leading a geoscience group in, 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 in an association called INAS, International Network of Algerian Scientists, where we organize monthly webinars. And today at five o'clock, we are going to have um, this lecture by Professor Saibi Hakim, who's going to teach us more about the geothermal resources in Algeria. I know there is another webinar with SPE, uh, with, uh, with Mohsin, I think, so I will not spoil you. This is going to be recorded even if you miss it. Just go to the 
Google and then search for the potential geothermal resources in Nigeria, and you can see the recording of the, of the conference. Okay, now I'm going to, to discuss about another uh, key uh, important player for the, for the energy transition, uh, which is the CCUS, carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Um, I think there will be a lecture in SPE. The last one is going to be about the CCUS, so um, I will not give you too much details, probably more give you an insight as a geophysicist what we need to know for CCUS projects monitoring. So what is CCUS technology? So the CCUS stands for Carbon Capture, Usage, and Storage Utilization. It's a technology that can capture and make effective the use uh, of, of, uh, of high concentration of CO2 emitted by industrial activities. Consequently, it has a key role to play in decarbonization in addressing the challenges of the global climate change. So in a nutshell, this is what we do. We try to, to capture the CO2 emitted and then try to store it at the subsurface, okay? So if there is too much CO2 here, we can still store it and then keep it on the subsurface. Okay, so the CCUS uh, is not a new technology, basically. The CCUS is, is a legacy from what is being done in the oil and gas, and this is what we call the enhanced oil recovery, EOR. Uh, so we have been injecting CO2 in the, in the oil and gas industry for decades, decades now, and uh, actually try to enhance the, the, the oil production by pumping CO2 at the subsurface on the reservoir and try to push or squeeze the, 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 the remaining oil and take it back to the surface. So this is actually a similar concept we are going to, to, to do for CCUS, but, for this, but this time we are going to store it for good, or, well, for good or for a long time, and then probably reuse it. You know, we are going to reuse this, this carbon for future, uh, future EOR project, for example, or for other purposes that we don't know. Probably in the future, we will see more implications of this. But the, the, the main challenge here remain on how we are going to keep and monitor and store this, uh, this carbon at the subsurface uh, without really having uh, a big problem, environmental problem in the future. So there are different stages of CO2 uh, capture and storage. Basically, we are going to go, to go from, 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 from the top, from the, from, the down, from, the, from the downstream to upstream, you know, we are going the other, uh, the, other, the other way around here. We start by capturing the CO2 and then transporting it, and then we are going to store it at the subsurface. And as a geoscientist, this is where uh, our, our job is going to be. You know, we are going to monitor and we are going to estimate how the carbon is going to behave at the subsurface, you know? So this jo our job is number three and number four. Um, we need to, to, to understand the reservoir elastic parameters, how the reservoir is going to behave on the future after five, three, 10 years. We also need to understand what kind of the different physical or, or mechanism that are going to change our, our reservoir in the future to avoid leakage, okay? So this is our job for us as a geophysicist in the future. And to do that, we need to use what we call uh, as a geophysicist, uh, reservoir elastic modeling. Some people call it 4D seismic feasibility, okay? So, so far, uh, reservoir engineers and seismic numerical simulation used to be separ working separately. You know, we have reservoir engineering teams who are doing to, to run their dynamic model, try to estimate the oil reserve or the water flow or the carbon storage, you know, whatever liquid you put on the surface production and estimate this after five, 10 years. Meanwhile, geophysicists are working on what we call a static model. Static model, you know, do not include the 4D Time, time, timeline. So in order to match or the gap, the gap between the static model for geophysicists and the dynamic model uh, that reservoir engineers used to do, we use what we call the reservoir elastic model. This is going to include uh, a time factor in our reservoir simulation as geophysicists and estimate how the reservoir is going to behave, what kind of VP, what kind of VS, what kind of density are we going to have after five years, 10 years, or 30 years of storage. Okay, so this is actually a very similar scheme that we use for uh, reservoir production when you estimate uh, your, your, um, your, your oil production for five, 10, five days, uh, five years, 10 years, or 15 years. So we are going to estimate how the reservoir is going to behave when you pump carbon in the subsurface. Okay, so this is where we are going to use uh, reservoir elastic modeling as, as geophysicists. So we also call it 4D feasibility because we are going to keep monitoring uh, seismically. Um, the different stage of, of, of storage and, and, and try to understand how the reservoir behaves, but we can do this numerically before acquiring any seismic data. For this, you need to build a 3D, a very, uh, a very accurate 3D uh, static model, a 3D model, and then you do uh, some kind of elastic property estimations, how the reservoir is going to behave. You simulate the behavior of the reservoir 
of your carbon reservoir after 10 years and see when you keep including you know, CO2, keep injecting CO2 for a certain rate, how your VP and VS and density are going to change over time. And then you can simulate the behavior of the seismic, uh, of the seismic waves by running 3D seismic simulation, okay? Uh, this is a very simplistic example here. Let's say you started your carbon, uh, storing the carbon in 2005, and then you calculate the uh, carbon saturation in 2016 or 16 or 15 after 10 years, and you can even estimate the VP and the VS and the density after certain years of, 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 of storage, okay? And then you can estimate the synthetics and compare the synthetics, how the seismic data will behave, how the amplitude of the seismic data will look after 10 or 15 years of storage. And you can understand your zones of the, your, your, uh, your reservoir zones where they are more susceptible uh, to, be, uh, to be affected by the storage of the carbon, okay? Uh, this is another example here showing how the uh, simulation of seismic data can, can give you results of uh, before and after the storage or before and after production. You can manually uh, change uh, the physical parameters and run the simulation of the seismic data and understand how your plan is going to behave. Okay? Um, there is another case study here for CCUS. Probably it is the most um, known example. Uh, it's a 20 years of, of, um, of, um, of CCS storage in, in, uh, in in Norway, in the North Sea, it's called the Sleipnir field. Uh, just out of curiosity, Sleipnir is the eight-legged horse with supernatural strength that belongs to the god Odin, I'm a great fan of, of mythology. So it's very interesting to see how uh, North people are, are, are naming their fields, okay? So this is where the Sleipnir field is located. It's between the UK and Norway. Uh, it's in the North Sea. And they started injection um, of the CO2 since 1996. So you can see that it's one of the world's, I think it's the world's first industrial offshore CO2 capture and, uh, and storage project, okay? And they've been pumping it uh, since then. So they, 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 they stored their, their, C, uh, their carbon in, in uh, what they call it, it's called Utser formation. It's a saline formation and sandstone aquifer 800 meter below the sea level. It's not very deep. Uh, and they have a very thick uh, formation of shale formation uh, playing the role of a very, very thick, you know, overburdened uh, seal, okay? So it's very important to have a very, very thick seal to ensure that your CO2 is, going to, is not going to leak. So as you can see, this is a very um, not dangerous, but not mature enough technology and CCS need, CCUS need to, be, to mature more to, to, to have a certain control of, of what we are doing, okay? And um, for, for seismic data, they kept monitoring the, the, the CCS, the CO2 injection uh, after each five years, for, for each five years, I think. And you can see how the progress is changing. This is, in, uh, this is the, the seismic data acquired in 1994, in 2001, 2006, and 2010. And you can see uh, how the CO2 uh, storage zone is going to, to, to get bigger and bigger as, as, far, as far as we, as far as we, uh, we store it. So again, I will not spoil you too much about CCUS. I think you are going to have a whole session about it, but just keep in mind that as a geophysicist, it's very important to understand the dynamic behavior of the, of the reservoir using 4D seismic data or what we call reservoir elastic modeling to predict the behavior of the reservoir. Okay, now I'm going to jump to another topic, uh, methane hydrate exploration. Uh, the methane hydrate exploration, uh, the methane hydrates or the gas hydrates uh, are white ice-like solid that consists of methane and water commonly referring to as a burning ice. As you can see in this picture, it's really ice, you know, where, where, that you, where you put fire on it, they're going to burn. So the methane gas is primarily formed by microorganisms that lives in the deep sediment layer and slowly convert organic substance to methane, which is turned into cages. So this is the chemical structure of the methane hydrate. You have a small gas particle surrounded by a cage of water, you know. And why I'm showing this, this is very important, because as you can see, in order to extract the gas inside, inside the, the, the water cage, you need to break the structure of the methane hydrate so that you can extract this, this, you know, this holy grail, you know, this, this gas. So this is going to create a lot of instability, and this is where the methane hydrate are very, very difficult to, pro to product. You know, it's, it's not stable. Once you start producing them, they're going to crumble. You need to maintain specific temperature and specific temperature, uh, pressure and temperature to properly producing them. And I think so far only one well in Japan successfully produced uh, methane hydrate. But this is, again, this is an energy for the future that we need to understand and we need to learn about as a geophysicist and how we can rebrand geophysics 
to, to, to properly extract the methane hydrate. Uh, so the methane hydrate requires specific temperature and pressure conditions. Uh, usually we find them in a very cold areas, you know, in the, in the deep, in the deep ocean uh, where we have temperature less than zero degrees Celsius or in oceanic sediments at water depth gather than uh, greater than 300 meter. Okay, so this is a world map showing the estimation distribution, estimated distribution of the methane hydrate as you can see they are very prominent in the North Pole in Canada, uh, in Japan as well, we Africa also do have uh, African shelf do have some methane hydrate potential. I'm not sure about the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea and in Algeria. Probably we do have some pockets. Um, if, 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 uh, if, if we start doing investigation, we probably have some potential in, in, in the Mediterranean Sea. But again, this is something that is going to be a hot topic in the future if we successfully uh, start producing them. So uh, what you need to understand why the structure is not very stable is that the case hydrate uh, methans have some kind of stability zone. You know, we find them in specific, very specific condition uh, for pressure and temperature. And uh, this is what we call the gas hydrate stability zone. You need to, to be within uh, specific depth and temperature so that the gas hydrate are going to be stable. Otherwise, they're going to leak to the surface and you have some kind of bubbles, as you can see, and, and, and they're going to, 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 to leak at the surface and you cannot properly extract them. So usually, um, we find them under the seat, you know, cold days, you know, in, under the uh, ice, ice sheet or in the permafrost or along the, uh, along the continental shelves uh, in the deep sea. Okay, so the best way to investigate methane hydrates in your formation is, of course, seismic data. Okay, so for, for gas hydrate, you know, they are too difficult to detect using non-seismic methods. So we mainly rely on seismic data. And the particularity of the methane hydrate formation, geologically speaking, is the presence of a shallow high amplitude events associated to what we call the bottom simulating reflectors, PSR, which is a common indicator of the presence of the gas hydrate. This is how they look. Uh, it's, it's kind of, of a strong reflector at the bottom of your methane hydrate formation. You can see it here clearly. So this is not an anticline. This is the, 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 your, your methane hydrate here as a top. So you find this kind of BSR, bottom seismic reflector at the, at the bottom. And then usually they are associated with a flat spot uh, levels uh, due to the water existence here at the subsurface. So this is one of the clear indications of, P of, the, of the methane hydrate. If by chance you see this kind of structure, you know you have a strong reflector at the bottom of your reservoir, it can be. Uh, methane hydrate, but of course, you know, as a geophysics interpretation, you don't need to focus on on the seismic. You have to think globally. You know, what kind of reservoir are you dealing with? So, if you are dealing with some seismic data from Alaska or from from Nankai Trough in Japan, probably you, it can be some methane hydrate. So, the case study, uh, probably one of the most famous case studies uh, for methane hydrate exploration, is is the one in Japan. Uh, so, since 1996, the Japanese Ministry of Economy and uh, trade METI has been inten in intensively conducting exploration, exploration surveys of methane hydrates in what they call the Nankai Trough. This is the, the map of Japan. It's, called, it's located in the southern part of Japan. And this is the, the Kumano Basin uh, in, the, in the southern part of Japan where they did a very heavy exploration for 2D, 3D seismic and even drilled some well. Uh, so in March 2013, uh, this area recorded the world's first offshore production of the methane hydrate bearing layers, and uh, they produced more, one, more than 100, 120,000 meter cube of methane hydrate successfully, which is a really successful case because, as I said, it's very, very difficult to properly produce methane hydrates. Uh, the technology is, is, uh, is, not, is not mature enough. Um, let me show you how the methane hydrate looks in, in seismic data. So in the case of the methane hydrate in, in, in Japan, uh, they have a stratigraphic accumulation of methane hydrate uh, that are highly dispersive due to the gas hydrate stability zone. So using seismic attributes and using some kind of um, uh, decomposition, you know, um, you, can, you can see that the methane hydrates are, are, are located here in, along the channel distributed using, you can, we can map them using seismic attributes. So this is, the, this is a representation uh, of the, the, the methane hydrate distribution in, in, in the Japanese in, in Japan. They are around 100 metric depth uh, filling inter spatial pores in, in, in the sedimentary layers. Okay, uh, this is another seismic section showing uh, the, the PSR, the bottom seismic reflector of the same area. Uh, this is the methane hydrate bearing formation zone. This is the top of the uh, methane hydrate stability zone here in the seismic data. And you can see this very strong reflection at the button 
uh, indicating the existence of uh, the methane hydride formation. Again, this is something very new. Methane hydride are still very uh, they're still uh, under investigation, and uh, we are the technology is not mature enough. But as you can see, seismic can provide key elements uh, for for understanding the methane hydride structure at the subsurface. Okay, now let's go to another topic, probably a little bit. Uh, advanced, it's a planetary exploration and space exploration using uh, geophysics. So what you need to know is, um, you know, space exploration is not science fiction anymore, you know, uh, and, and we are not talking about some kind of SF, you know, fantasy stuff. So this is the proof, international space investment in numbers. So you can see that the space economy projected to grow by 3 trillion US dollar by 2050. It's a huge market. Many people, I mean, many countries are putting a lot of money to invest in space. Over 30 countries invested in space in 2019. Over 30 billion US dollar in private equity to be invested in exploring the moon and Mars in the next 10 years, right? And around 61 missions to the moon and Mars between 2020 and 2029. So this is not science fiction anymore, guys. This is, this is pure science. And you can see the numbers here. Um, um, this is the investment of, of space investment between 2010 and 2020. That was like 72 billions. And the projected space, in, uh, space project in investment in the next 10 years is going to be 47%, 121 billion. So the top players are the US, China, Russia, Europe, Japan, and other small players like India and other countries, especially with the boom of the private sector, uh, the space investment is going, uh, is going to play a huge role in the, in the next 10 years. Um, it's very important to see that most of the missions dedicated to explore space uh, are, 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 are dedicated to the moon. It's going to be the moon and Mars usually. So there is a lot of investment uh, on, on exploring the moon and Mars and we will see why. So why investing the moon? Why exploring the moon now? So there's actually um, some international plan to go back to the moon and place some kind of lunar base, just not only for science, but also for industrial purposes. Why? Because for every kilogram of payload sent to the moon, we are going to pay 1 million US dollar. So if you want to build, build your space base, your, your lunar base, it's going to cost you 1 million US dollar per kilogram. And you're going to produce 25 metric tons of CO2 produced. So instead of taking our resources from Earth to the moon, uh, many space agencies already started the roadmap to have a, what they call in-situ resources utilization. Okay, NASA and Luxembourg Space Agency already have a plan drafted where they are showing how are going to harvest the moon and how they are going to use the local geological resource of the moon to build the moon base and to probably commercialize it in the future. Okay. So why, um, um, why are we going to mine the moon? What are we going to get from them? The first thing is that we are going to get water. You know, recent researchers Research found that there is a lot of water in the in the polar region of the moon, and this water can be very very good uh, tool, you know, for propellant. You can use it for rockets. You know, you can use it to go back to the Earth. You cannot take your water from Earth. You can use water on the moon, in situ resource on the moon as water. And if you want to invest water, you are going to use geophysics, right? Uh, also, we are going to explore helium, which is a rare element, specially used for nuclear fusion, and also rare earth materials, usually used in our modern electronics devices. And especially, uh, we are going to investigate the lunar regolith, which is going to be used to build the lunar base. Uh, the lunar regolith is, 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 is kind of dust, you know, we have to re really understand how the dust is going to behave. And for this, we need geology and geophysics to investigate the moon, as well as Mars, Mars is still part, but the moon is, is the next step. Okay, so we, um, we have some geophysical data available on, the, on, our, on our satellite on the moon. Um, I'm talking to talk about the Apollo lunar surface experiments. I hope you guys know that we've been to the moon, right? This is not a conspiracy. And, uh, well, not us, but the United States uh, been to the moon uh, by, by, by NASA through different Apollo missions. And, and more interestingly, they placed, you know, some seismic recordings as at the different Apollo locations. This is the different Apollo landing sites. And we have seismic data. This is how the seismic, uh, how seismic station looks on the moon. And they recorded a lot of moonquakes, a lot of impacts that provided us very insightful information on the lunar structure, okay? So we do have seismic data placed on the moon at the different Apollo landing sites, and they're still being used up to, to date to explore the deep structures of the moon. We also have gravity mapping. You know, we have many orbiters, lunar orbiters, such as the lunar reconnaissance orbiters that provide us a very high, um, high, um, high accuracy, um, high resolution mapping of the surface of the moon. We also have what we call the GRAIL 
the Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory sent by NASA. So it's basically orbiting the moon and mapped all the gravity anomaly all around the moon. And this data can be used for scientists to explore the depth structures, okay? We're not on the stage of exploring reservoir yet. You know, this is a very new science, but we are start to have some data to explore the intermediate depth and understand uh, the structure of our satellite. And this is where it all starts, you know? And also more recently, uh, especially with the Chinese program, we have rovers uh, sent to the moon and these rovers have lunar penetrating radar and they can map uh, the regolith, the surface regolith structure of the moon down to 100 or 300 meters. You know, this is very seismic, to, uh, very similar to 2D or 3D seismic that can be used to understand the, the lunar structure regolith and how it can be used and extracted in the near future. So as you can see, we're already talking about pure science here. We are not talking about some kind of fantasy or science, some science fiction in, in the future. And for Mars, uh, we also have some, some very initial results from, from the InSight Mars lander. Uh, I think um, this, this um, actually we organized a webinar if you're interested about the topic with, with the association I'm, I'm, I'm leading. Uh, I think it was last month, yeah. I invited the uh, one researcher who introduced the InSight uh, seismic data. So if you're interested, please investigate. You, you can have it in YouTube, I think you can, you, can, you can see that it's in English. So we have some seismic data in the in, inside Mars lander. We only have one lander. And we also have gravity data, very similar to what we did to the moon. It's called the Goddard Mars model. Uh, NASA sent, a, sent a, a, Mars, a Mars orbiter that mapped the, the topography, the free air gravity, as well as the crustal thickness of the Mars of the red planet. And these data can be used to understand this geological structure of the, the red planet of Mars and, and how we can include this understanding for probable future exploration, okay? So as you can see, it's, it's, it's quite new topic. It's something that going on for the space exploration and especially that there is a lot of missions uh, going uh, to be sent to the moon and Mars in, in the next year. So we are going to have much more geology and geophysics data. So if you guys have a lot of work to do, you just need to think outside the box, you know, you need to know how you can use your, 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 your what you learned uh, in, in planetary exploration. Uh, this is another case study uh, I, I authored, you know, I participated with in. It's called Mapping Lunar Volcanism. This is a collaboration project with the University of Wuhan, where we try to map the, uh, the, the volcanic structure of the Aristarchus Plato. This is the moon here. This is the Aristarchus Plato. It's a volcanic system on the moon. And we are trying to, and to map uh, the volcanic chamber at the subsurface of the Aristarchus Plato using uh, gravity data inversion. Um, so yeah, so we, we I communicated this in last year AGU fall meeting. Uh, I got very we got very interesting results. So by the way, this is Petrel. You know, I'm using Petrel for the gravity inversion, and uh, we properly mapped the subsurface as well as some interesting anomalies. We are currently also writing a paper about this. Uh, hopefully, to see it published very soon. Okay. All right. So uh, I think yeah, I think it's time. We still have ten minutes before we close this. So these are my personal opinions and conclusions from the how we can rebrand geophysics for the near future. Uh, again, this is my personal opinion, so probably it's going to be very biased, but uh, I'm going to present this. So the new energy market will start with implementing or what I call rebranding existing expertise in geophysics. So as you can see, we are using to, to use 4D seismic data for CCUS. We are going to use uh, geomechanics for, for geothermal seismic data interpretation for, for, um, for, for methane hybrid exploration and even uh, gravity inversion for the moon and, and, and Mars. Uh, you need to keep aware that be aware that the cloud-based automated technologies will play a major role in the energy transition. Uh, you need to know the basics of machine learning, you know, the basics of, basics of how these kind of algorithms are going to change your daily routines. You know, we are not going to do manual seismic interpretations in the next five years, probably. It's going to be automated, even for log interpretation or probably um, well bore correlation. This is all be going to be automated. So you need to understand and learn how is, these things works before you graduate. Uh, remote sensing technology will open a new perspective probably. We already started seeing remote sensing technology getting more and more mature and doing some kind of inversion will help us to map the subsurface. Probably drone exploration will bring another, you know, another rock to the, to, to the wall and it's going to be really a uh, hot topic in the near future. I believe that geomechanics will gain more and more importance, especially for CCUS reservoir monitoring and geothermal energy, and um, as well as the reservoir elastic modeling. You know, if you want to do CCUS, then you really need to master 
how you can estimate and how you can simulate your reservoir uh, behavior uh, using seismic seismic simulation and reservoir elastic modeling. So I think we will we will witness a boom of the CC of of, uh, of 4D seismic in the CCUS project. And also, finally, we witnessed the emergence of planetary exploration for in situ resource exploration. Uh, planetary geophysics used to be there for more than 20 or 30 years ago, but it was just for pure scientific reasons. But now we are using geophysics and geology to understand the geology of the moon and Mars for in situ uh, resource exploration. Okay. All right. So these are my messages for the students around here. Uh, first of all, despite the energy transition, you have to understand that, of course, we are transiting, but the oil and gas is still prominent in the current energy mix, right? We are not going to get rid of oil and gas in the next five years. Uh, it's going to take time, but you have to be keep in mind that it's a transition. Transition take a lot of time, maybe 10, 10, 10 years or so. Uh, read more about renewable and think how you can contribute to this new market. This is your market. You know, you guys are young, you're study, your students. So this renewable energies needs your expertise needs you to, 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 to carry on on the market. So don't be afraid about the word of renewables. Read about hydrogen, right? About methane hydrate, try to learn more about it while strengthening your know-how in the oil and gas, okay? Because as you can see, we are using our expertise in the oil and gas exploration and try to rebrand it for renewables. So it's important to strengthen your, 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 your learning on the geophysical methods for oil and gas and how you can rebrand it into the new market. Again, Automation and data openness is changing the way we do geophysics. Um, try to learn more about machine learning, try to learn about coding, you know, try to learn about uh, how you can get any, any code, any source code from GitHub and then use it in your program. Programming can be very important for geophysics. Uh, with the internet, ignorance is a choice. Get inspired, learn for yourself, ask questions. You know, it's an open world, especially with the COVID, after the COVID, we all are working remotely. We are having the chance to have such webinars and gathering the community virtually. So don't miss any opportunity and even take the leap. Why not to organize something yourself? You know, sky is the limit. And then finally, learning program, learn programming, as already mentioned this, improve your English skills and dream big. Okay. I know you guys, uh, many, uh, many attendees are not English native, na native English speaker. I myself not English native speaker. So try to improve your English to communicate with the international community, learn programming, and don't be afraid. Okay, with that said, I will leave you with the references. Uh, you can take a snapshot of the different references I, I used in my presentation. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, your questions and comments are welcome. If you want to reach me by direct email, this is my email, Michelin Berger. And you can have me on LinkedIn, ResearchGate, or if you want to learn more about my research, ResearchGate and Google Scholar. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, sir, for uh, your time and for sharing with us uh, this knowledge. Uh, it was very beneficial. Thank you very much and for accepting our invitation. Um, I would like to invite you all to write your questions in the chat box so that Mr. Amrush can answer them. Or if you'd like to speak or discuss something, uh, just go ahead and raise your hand so that we can give you the mic. So uh, I'm gonna start reading the questions for you, sir. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay, so the first question from uh, Akin Muda, he says, what's the economic importance of geothermal energy? Oh, good question. Uh, so I don't have numbers in mind, uh, but I think um, as I showed the picture before, we only using 5% of the global geothermal energy potential. Uh, so again, this is very promising potential that you have, especially in Asia and South Asia. And uh, it is going to be a, a very, very important market uh, in, in, in the future. Okay. Another question, uh, which programming language can you recommend for a data scientist, sir? Oh, definitely Python. It's the easiest, you know, it's the most affordable. This is where you can find a lot of open source data, uh, open source subroutine. So you just need to really learn the, the basics of Python and then you can take any subroutine from the internet as I said, it's the age of openness. Uh, many, many people are kindly putting all their, uh, their Python work on, on, on the internet. So please 
try to learn Python, it's very, very convenient. You don't need to compile, you know, your program it runs very fast and uh, you can have a ready to go programs free, for, free to use. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, I can't see any other questions. Solar thermal, similar to geothermal. Yes, there's another question. Uh, so solar thermal, similar to geothermal storage solution, is it still challenging? Solar thermal, similar to geothermal storage solution. What do you mean? Do you mean like solar panel exploration? Uh, I didn't understand the question, but uh, well, what I'm talking about here, what I introduced is, is what we use from the subsurface. I didn't uh, talk about solar or windmill in general, but I just emphasized on, on subsurface, uh, subsurface uh, geophysical implementation. So uh, I'm not sure about, about solar thermal here. Um, I don't know, let's just wait. Maybe he will explain his question sure. more. Um, another question, with this future trend, does it mean that oil and gas industry will finally deviate to clean energy? Oh, you know, that's a $1 million $1 question. I can't really answer this uh, because only the future will, will tell us what's going to happen. But what is sure is that it's not going to deplete in the near future. It's not going to stop in the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, the oil and gas will still remain here uh, as an important player in the future energy mix. Of course, probably it will reduce, but to see a total replacement by renewable energies, it's still too early to, to judge. You know, we're still producing a huge energy from oil and gas, and this is not something that ready to change from, from the next 10 years. But again, it will deplete for, for the next, in the near future, for sure. Okay. Uh, is, the, is it possible to get a, a copy of this presentation slides? Uh, Sorry, Lester. This is, this is not something I can share. <laughs> Probably okay. I can see the video online, but I can't share the slides. Yes, we will post uh, the presentation at the end on our YouTube channel, so you can sure. find it. Um, I can't see any other questions. Uh, I guess we can give them a few more minutes if they can think of anything else they can they have to ask or. If you don't mind, of course. Of course, yeah. The Lars. I think I see. I see a question from Patrick: uh, injection yes. of CO two yes. in the ground is the only way to reduce the CO2 in the atmosphere? Uh, it, no, no, this is one of the ways uh, we already know how to, to, to do uh, by enhanced oil recovery. We already know how to inject CO2, but uh, probably the future will tell us that it will not be the only way. Who knows, uh, you know, science development cannot, we will not stop. So probably we will end up with some new, uh, new methods on, on reducing CO2 from the, from the atmosphere. Okay, uh, how can I be active member of SPE and be part of the next call? You can contact us uh, at the end of this uh, meeting uh, so that we can give you more information about that. Uh, you can find us on uh, social media as SPE University of uh, Boomerdest, Student Chapter University of Boomerdest. I guess these are all the questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and end this session. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you for joining us today and for sharing with us uh, all this experience and knowledge. It was uh, very uh, beneficial to all of us. Uh, thank you for your time and for being here. And hopefully we will get to meet you again uh, maybe in real life in our future events.
Thank you. I, I would like to thank all the students from Bloomer Desk for taking such initiative. Uh, I think it's a real pleasure to, to do such events again. I would like to reiterate my, my, my knowledge and, and my, my, my appreciation. And, and uh, thank you again for letting me share sharing my, my experience with you guys. Thanks. Thank you very much. And thanks for the attendance. Thank you very much. All right. So any closing words? Are we, are we done? Uh, I guess so, yeah. Thank you so, so Thank much. Thank you. Sir. Have a good day. Thanks. Thank you.